Hello and welcome to our bookshop in Tring. I'm Ben Morehouse. So we've got another author interview. And we're lucky to be talking to Heather Morris. Um, she's dialing in from Melbourne, the other side of the world. So definitely the longest distance we've held one of our YouTube interviews over. Uh, now Heather famously has written The Tattooist of Auschwitz, definitely one of the books of the last decade. And she followed that up with um, Silka's Journey. And uh, more recently she's written Stories of Hope. And here's the book, uh, Finding Inspiration in Everyday day Lives, and um, focuses on um, Heather's amazing ability as a, as a listener more than anything else. So uh, I do hope you enjoy that. She's in conversation with Antonia Honeywell. Thank you very much, Ben. And what a privilege and an honour it is for me to be here with Heather Morris. Hello, Heather. Hello. Good evening or good morning. Whatever the time no, we, don't know when people, we don't know when people are watching, so we'll just stick with hello. <laughs> exactly. Kia ora, as we would say in New Zealand. Kia ora, all my oh. Kiwi friends. Oh, lovely. Um, we are obviously talking about this beautiful book today, um, Stories of Hope. Um, this, was, this was produced very quickly, wasn't it, Heather? You, re you refer in the, in, in the introduction to January 2020. And we're only in November now, and the book was actually published on the 17th of September. That's a feat of writing. How was it to write? Ah, you've got me there. Um, I actually wrote it last year. Ah. When I had that introduction just before it went to the printer, it, it just seemed to make sense to me that I needed to make a comment on how 2020 had gone. And so we added that little bit into the front. But no, the, the, the bulk of it was all well and truly written before the end of last year. It just happens we had a pandemic and I wrote a book about hope. It could not have been more timely or appropriate for, for what we need right now. Did, did, did you make the pandemic happen for your book then? Mm. Is it you? Don't go there. I may have done <laughs> or not. <laughs> so where did Stories of Hope come from then within you? Because obviously your previous two books, the absolutely staggeringly best-selling Tattooist of Auschwitz and then the, the follow-up, um, Silka's Journey. Where did this one come from? Because we're in non-fiction now. Yeah, it's uh, not a memoir, folks. There's no way you're going to get to know all about me. But it actually originated, well, it originated on several levels, but primarily I was in Kosciuszko in Slovakia with my a London publisher, Margaret, and we had spent the day talking to local people there. We were doing research for Silka. So we'd spent the day with people who knew Silka and were telling us about her, her friends and neighbours. And uh, later on that evening, Margaret and I were all sitting in a hotel, uh, had some dinner and some drinks. We then wandered into the little bar and have some port and some coffee. And Margaret commented to me that she had been observing me sitting with these people who I'd never met before, many of them in their 80s and 90s. They never spoke English. I never spoke Slovakian, other than to say, Jacquem, which is thank you every now and then. But I had, from her observation, totally engaged with these people. And they were just opening up and sharing everything they could, not only about Silka, but about themselves too. Now, two translators were working 10 to the dozen in the room with me. And she said, how did you do that? How do you sit and listen and have people know that you're listening? And I said, oh, well, I think I was on my third port at the time. And I went, well, um, my great grandfather, Gramps, the only person in my life when I was growing up who I think ever bothered to not only listen to me, but who I felt that I could listen to him because he taught me how to listen. And uh, that was really special to me as a young girl to spend every second afternoon with this amazing old man who lived two paddocks away from me. And uh, back home, there was four young brothers and all well, there was but a lot of noise and no one listened to anybody. And then my great grandfather said, your world will open up even sitting there on his back veranda with him and we listen to nothing, listen to the sound around us, listen to ourselves. So I guess I just got it, always knew. You just, you said your, grand, your great grandfather taught you to listen. Pretty much. And that's what Stories of Hope is about because I listen to him 
For 20 years working in a large public hospital in here in Melbourne, in the social work department, every day I had to listen to people who, well, nine times out of 10, they woke up that morning and that they did not know that they would be meeting me. They now found themselves in an acute hospital. More often than not, I was with the family members or friends. And uh, they were there because something traumatic or tragic had happened to them. There was not much point in me talking. I needed to listen to them. And I did that for 20 years. And then, of course, Lully, I was able to get his trust by listening. These wonderful people in Slovakia and Kosita, I listened to them as they told me about Silka. And I'm listening to another story right now, too. And you'll hear about that next year. You had a little taste of it back in the book. <laughs> You do, you do, and I'm I'm going to going to come on to that later on. And um, now I've got questions of my own, obviously, but we've also been hearing from um, other readers who have got some questions for you as well. So I'll be weaving those in and out. Um, but first, the first question that I'm going to start with questions because other readers are more important than I am, really. Um, and um, it, it's uh, from Alison, and Alison has is going back to back to the tourist of Auschwitz, which we can't talk to without talking a little bit about that. Um, and she would like to know um, whether you'd actually visited the Auschwitz and Birkenau camps before you began to write the tourist of Auschwitz. No, Alison, I definitely had not, and I did not until the book was at the printers. Uh, once I got to know Lully, and I think I'd um, fess up in Stories of Hope how little I knew about the Holocaust. And no, I had not been there. And so I then deliberately did not go because I did not want to describe that place through my eyes. And of course, I would have been seeing it 50, 60 years after the events. I needed to describe it through Lully's eyes. So it wasn't until the book was out that I went there for the first time. And can we just marry that up with what we were talking about just now about the listening? How did you actually meet Lally? What? How did you get that story um this actually <coughs> excuse me this actually connects with um, several questions that have come in in lots of different ways from different people um but how was that it's a it's an incredible story to be holding and to have given that over can you just talk a little bit about that and how that actually happened in the first place well look it's beautifully simple after many months of saying no to a friend and in, in terms of catching up I, I live out of Melbourne, and so to go into the city to, to meet with her, I'd been putting it off. And then finally I did. On a Sunday afternoon, we're having a coffee, and she just casually said to me, I have a friend whose mother has just died. His father has asked him to find somebody he can tell a story to. That person can't be Jewish. You're not Jewish. Do you want to meet him? I said, what's his story? And she said, oh, I don't know. So I said, okay, never mind. Yes, I'd love to meet him. And a week later, I knocked on the apartment door of Lali Sokolov, grieving terribly for the loss of his wife of 60 plus years. And uh, yeah, that's how I got it. I had a cup of coffee and I said yes to meeting a strange man. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lesson there, in that, isn't there, that, that also comes out in various of the stories and st of stories and hope, of, sorry, various of stories in stories of hope about saying yes, about accepting opportunities when the universe serves them up to you and you did that and what came out of it was incredible. How well, absolutely. I, I looked for many months, so I didn't know what I had with him. I didn't know if there was a story there that could be woven together because well, it wasn't his memory that was bad. It was more that Lully did not want to be with me. He wanted to tell his story, but he, would, he wanted to be with Gita. And so he was caught between a rock and a hard place. I need you to tell my story. I need to be with Gita. And it was only as that trust built between the two of us that he got to know not only me, but my family, because I took him home to meet my family, you know, figuring that that would be the best way for him to get to know anything about me was to meet them. Well, that kind of worked in a big time as my children on that very first, they're young adults, that very first time they met him over dinner, decided to share every one of my little secrets and foibles and faults. <laughs> and uh, he learned way more than I ever intended him to, but uh, it just made me real to him, he said. How did that feel? 
Oh, really weird. And I had words with him after I'd dropped him back home and um, came back home. Did you have to share everything on day one? But um, they didn't know if there would be a day two, so they thought, yes, they would. Because I'd heard about him for many weeks and uh, totally was spellbound and charmed by him. And I wonder if, if that um, openness and honesty on the part of your children, that can only have brought you closer, really. Oh, absolutely. And he said that. It did the trick. It was enough for him to know that, um, yes, I was not uh, somebody that was a closed book, that if he wanted to know anything about me, he could ask. And um, he, he heard it all anyway. But there was another factor, too, in terms of him just having that total breakdown and being able to not just talk so clinically um, about his experiences that I needed that emotional aspect to it. And every now and then he would start saying something and then he'd just shake his head and put it down and he'd stop. So I knew something was blocking him. Now we had these two dogs. One of them was huge. She was you know, about the size of a small pony and another one that was smaller than my cat. And they were with us every time I was in his apartment and they'd bring a tennis ball to him and he'd just take it out of their mouth, throw it over his shoulder and they would fight for it. But then not long after he'd been home and met my family for the first time, Tootsie, who was the big dog, she came up and she had the tennis ball in her mouth and he reached down to take it and she growled at him and he smacked around her ears and said, give me the ball. And she growled again. And then she turned around and she put her head on my knee. I looked down at this huge teeth, put my hand into her mouth and she released the ball. I threw it over my shoulder and she and Bam Bam chased after it. And that's when Lully actually turned to me and he went, oh, my doggies like you. I like you. You can tell my story. So there's the other secret, get along with the pets. <laughs> Have you got pets? Um, I, I had a dog and a cat, both of which got to the ripe old age of 17 about two years wow. ago. And I was with me. And because of the amount of traveling I do, I'm, I'm just taking a breather until I settle back down again but oh no I love my my dogs and my cats they they are they are very very we just we just got our first dog it's turning our lives upside down <laughs> but that's a really that's a beautiful story um now moving <clears throat> it was very important wasn't it that to tourist of Auschwitz and Silka's journey they're novels they're presented as novels you did not write them as history you wrote them as story um how hard was it then? Because there was quite a lot of backlash, particularly with the tourist of Auschwitz, um, about it as, as historical, um, you know, historical inaccuracies, things you'd changed from historical fact in order to make the story come alive. But you were always very clear that this was story. How did yeah. it feel as a writer to be on the receiving end of that when you'd written something so full of beauty? Well, it's about 1% of the criticism is negative. The other 99% has been amazing. Oh, now, so when it came to determining you know, how to write it, and it was suggested to me that I should write a memoir, so I went to memoir school for a day. It was a five-day course, but I knew after one day I couldn't tell his story that way. Now, I had written his story initially as a screenplay because I didn't know how to write a novel. So I had a screenplay which was uh, optioned here in Melbourne. Lully had been involved with the producers and the directors trying to make it into a film. Now, Lully had signed off on the screenplay. And in the screenplay, you use dialogue. You know, you fill them with conversations. That's how you move the story forward. And I wanted to keep that way of telling his story in his words. Plus, with a memoir or biography, you're restricted in being able to bring anybody else into the, the, the picture because you can only describe what Lully had seen and experienced himself. Well, there's Gita gone. There's the bigger picture of what's going on in those camps you know, taken away unless he was there. And when I sat down to write it, um, I adapted my screenplay. And Lully was there on my shoulder the whole time yelling at me whenever I wrote something that was different and saying, not like that, I told you like that. And so yes, I know I've written it as uh, fiction, but 99% of what I've written in there actually happened and it is his memory. 
I have not told the story of the Holocaust. I have just told a Holocaust story and I have yet to meet a survivor in any country, any town who has been critical of that fact, yet to meet anybody. That's, that's wonderful, that's wonderful. And it is, as you say, it's, it's stories through which we connect. It's stories that, that keep us alive. Um, and that's, well, I would say it's never been more important than now, but actually it's been important every crisis we've ever had in history all the way through, hasn't it? Well, absolutely. And, and here's the lovely thing. I was talking at a synagogue in Sydney and the rabbi, when he was introducing me, made the comment that in Hebrew, there is no word for history. And I had people in Israel confirm that, that all the stories that they have, that, that the Jewish culture and religion have, must come from the memories of those who lived it. So they don't have a word for history. So your books are honouring that even more. How they are the memory of the people as given to me, absolutely. And uh, I was at uh, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Centre in, in Jerusalem, and the people there were saying how delighted they were with the book and they were selling it in both English and Hebrew. And to them, it was, to be, it was just a brilliant account of one man's memory of his time in the Holocaust. And they're fine with that. How did that feel to see it in Hebrew? Hebrew is so beautiful, isn't it? It's the, the, the shapes. Yeah. And, and how did that feel as an author to see your book in Hebrew with that subject matter? Well, absolutely. That is the one language which, although I can't read any of it, um, that book draws me to it for that very reason, because of its connection you know, to the Jewish faith. Um, and I forget that you've got to read it from the back to the front, but um, <laughs> I'm not reading it anyway. I'm just flicking through the pages and love it. But you know, it's in 47 different languages yeah. and I'm delighted with this, all these amazing covers that I have from all around the world. Oh, it's wonderful. It's, it's a, did you know, Heather, did you know when you were writing it that it was going to do this, that it was just gonna light up the sky? It came out just when I started doing my, um, my radio show, my book radio show. And I was doing the charts of the books um, each week, once a week. And the Tattooist of Auschwitz was always there, always there somewhere for you know, months and months and months. And, and every now and again, it would go down a bit. And then a week or two later, whew, there it would be again. There, there's something perennial and universal about it. Did you know that when you wrote it? No, I didn't. Um... I think mostly because we were only going to initially publish it here in Australia. Well, actually, I was going to self-publish. I wanted the story told. Now, the last thing I said to Lully, the night he died, two hours before he died, when I was alone with him, as I left him, I said to him, I will never, ever stop trying to tell your story. Now, that was the 31st of October, 2006. I hung on to it as a screenplay, thinking that that was my vision for it. But... Um, no, I had no idea. I just hoped that people would uh, grasp not only the beauty of the love story of he and Gita, but the, the significance of who he was. The, the person, I was going to use the word responsible, it's a funny word, but who, who made those numbers. He called them numbers. He didn't say he tattooed, he numbered. But the most iconic symbol that we have of the, of the Holocaust um, in terms of uh, how it took off, that was an absolute smack in the face uh, to me. I had no idea. And my US publisher sent me an, an email of, oh, it's about six weeks ago to say that it, it had just rolled over 100 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. So, um, yeah, it resonates because it's relatable. One person. And how has it changed your life, Heather? How has your life changed since this? Well, I got to retire and travel the world and talk about um, this amazing man. And not only about him, but the other people who have come into my life as a result of meeting Lully. And, and I'm talking about a lot of other Holocaust survivors here in Australia who I met with him. And of course, everywhere I go. And yeah, you know, what an absolute honour it is to be able to go to these countries where the book is out and spend time with with the readers i love it 
And that's part of the reason also why Stories of Hope was written. Because after I would speak to, um, at a, an event, so many of the people who then came to talk to me made the comment, I regret that I did not talk to my grandfather, my father, my mother, my uncle, who either were in the Holocaust or had, had something in their lives which they'd heard a little bit about and it was something remarkable or extraordinary and they hadn't gone and followed up and I was hearing regret, regret, regret. Well, maybe with stories of hope, people can look at it and go, okay, let's just do something about talking to those people in our lives that matter. Yeah. Yes. Now that brings us really, really nicely um, to, to Harriet's question, which is one I wanted to ask as well. Um, you, you hear a huge amount of devastation and misery and of the worst possible sides of humanity um, here. Did writing, does writing these stories have an effect on your own well-being? This is a question from Kim. Thank you, Kim. Um, how do you protect your own well-being when you're hearing and trans and mediating these terrible stories for, for us? Oh, look, thank you, Kim. Uh, well, one thing about working where I did in a hospital was that I knew that whenever I was talking with somebody, which was five days a week for 20 years, hearing their pain and their trauma, that it was not my pain and I had no right to own any part of it that you cannot help somebody if you actually allow their pain and trauma to land on your shoulders. Now that's all well and good when you're dealing in an acute situation with people that you're only going to be seeing for maybe a few days or a week or two. And I was pretty good initially with Lully, but then I did get to a point when I did not realize I had uh, broken my own rules about allowing him to affect me. And it was, um, it came about because my kids started saying to me, what's going on with you? I used to come home from being with him and that asked me about him and I would tell him. And then all of a sudden I just switched off and I just said, he's fine, he's fine. There'd be nothing more to add. And uh, you're talking to a friend of mine, a colleague at work, you know, one day when Lully had rung while I was, and she was in my office talking and he rang and he just yelled at the phone at me. Where have you been? I haven't seen you. And I said, okay, honey, I'll be there later on after work. Because if I didn't go and see him, yeah, you know, once a week, yeah, you know, he would get upset. Uh, now, I guess because he'd lost Gita, a dependency of sort came. He he decided to trust me with his story, and so he, he needed to then to be a, a constant in his life. And that was no hardship, folks. Don't get me wrong; quite the opposite. But I did say to my colleague, I, I'm not sure I can do this. I just, yeah, you know, it's really hitting me I'm struggling to be with him she just smacked me around the head and said oh for goodness sake classic case of transference get over it you know that find a way to deal so I found a way to deal which is simply I would leave Lully he had a, um, an apartment on the first floor that overlooked the road and I always parked right outside his apartment he and the doggies would go to the balcony and he would always go to the door kiss me goodbye and they say I will see you to your car well, that meant for him, while I was going down the stairs, he would run to the balcony and look over so he could see me get into the car. And uh, so I knew I couldn't sit there. I had to drive away. And so I'd just drive around into a quiet street and I would sit there for oh, up to 10 minutes just on my own and just sing to myself. And... Or I would say to him the next time I saw him, that was really, really hard for me. You know, what went on? I'm just, you're really, I'm so distressed. And he'd give me a hug and he'd go, I'm here, I'm fine. What have you got to worry about? So Kim, in answer to your question, um, for the most part, not a problem because I knew it wasn't my pain or trauma or guilt to deal with. A little bit different with Silka because I didn't have her in my life. And when I was receiving information from my uh, re researcher in Moscow about, well, Wakuta Gulag and what that place was like, that was incredibly distressing. And all I could do was yell at the husband and the dog. Um, once again, because it was I had no outlet for that, like I had Lali. No, no, because Silka grew out of 
Potato is the Welsh for its, didn't it? Silka. Did you know that did you know that Silka was going to be your next thing or did that arise organically um, as I, as the began to sell? I knew that if I could get a deal with for Lully's story, because once again I'd also promised Lully. He made me promise when you finish telling my story, and he'd wag his finger and go, only after you've told mine, he said, You must tell the world about Silka, the bravest person I ever knew. And, uh, and I was honouring a promise to do that as well for him. Once again, I did not know what I'd be able to get to do that, but I uh, put your mind to it. Now, what helped immensely, and this is also the, the last bit to, to answer your question, Kim, was I had all that research from Russia, from Moscow, about Vorkota, which had left me absolutely so angry. I didn't know who to hit. As I say, I yelled at the dog instead. But when I then went to Koshita and met her friends and neighbours, and I then heard about what a beautiful, loving, caring woman she was. Everybody loved Silka. I met women in their 50s who said to me, she's been my second mother all my life. Not only one, but several. In Slovakia, you get given a, a place to live, an apartment if, or, a, or a house if you're lucky, but she lived in an apartment block now, Silka never had any children of her own. And so when, and particularly in winter, the young boys and girls came back to, after school and if their parents went home and they were locked out, Silka was there every afternoon to gather up all those children and take them into her apartment and give them warm drinks, keep them warm because their parents knew exactly where to find them. And so when I heard that, you know, it made it actually a lot better for me to be able to accept uh, the horror and evil that she had endured because it did not break her far from it. Right. You're finding the good. You're finding the good and the true and the beautiful and holding on to that. Absolutely. Every step Which of the way. What you're giving us in Stories of Hope. <laughs> Which, um, Which... Sorry? I'm trying to give them to you. But people... <laughs> When I go and talk to people now, um, they don't want me to talk about the tattooist or soccer, the, the books. Hey, I'll read them. Tell me something I don't know. So I find out that I was always talking about my relationship with Lali. And then um, more recently, of course, my research and how I uncovered Silka's story. So not about the books themselves. So once again, for everyone who doesn't get to hear me talk, I share some of those lovely little vignettes of my time with Lully. Yes, and it, it, make, it makes for, as I say, a very timely book for us, particularly now. Um, Harriet has asked, um, how hard was it to transform those hours of interviews and all those reams of conversation um, into a final story? First thing, Harriet, I never interviewed him. I would never consider at any point did I interview Lully. I sat and listened to him. I never had a pen and paper. I never had a recording device. I just listened. And when you actively listen to somebody, you actually don't need to record it. You, you ingest it, you take it on board, and, you, and then I could go home and I could write up notes for sure. But yeah, of course, it never made sense for, for months. He, Lully couldn't tell a complete story if he tried. It was a matter of just going home, making those notes, and then trying to see where they, they, they hung together. And of course, with the Holocaust, hey, I've got a timeline here that I've got to be true to. And so by having the timeline of when things were actually happening, even though Lali had an incredible memory for dates and times, he could tell me that it was June 43 that he went into the camps where the gypsies were and, that's, and then when they were taken. He knew when all those significant things happened. And so um, for me, it was a matter of making sure I did not deviate from that timeline. And his story was very easily then woven into it. Plus I had Gita, I have a two hour videotape of Gita talking about her time there. And um, can I say, tell you that the character Dana, Gita's best friend, her name is actually Lottie and she turns 97 in 10 days time. And she lives up in Sydney and I got to meet her through Lully many, many, many years ago and, uh, and get from her what it was like for the, the girls and the, and the girls' blocks. So 
So her name is Lottie. She's a beautiful, beautiful woman. She's a living national treasure in Australia, one of the people who really started and, and developed many decades ago the Holocaust uh, Museum in Sydney, which is now you know, big and huge and massive and a, a pride and a, a, the, not only the Jewish community, but the whole state of New South Wales. Well, ha happy birthday, Lottie. That's wonderful. Isn't, isn't that oh, I was there when she turned 95 two years ago. And, um, and look, this is how revered this lady is. Um, I was invited to, to go to her 95th birthday party. Now, I was there with the, her family and friends, and there was uh, the Premier of New South Wales, there was a Slovakian um, ambassador, there were all these significant people, because that is how revered this beautiful, beautiful lady is. How, how that that's wonderful. Now we are also. I, mean, I keep. I'm aware that we're meant to be talking about stories of hope, but stories of hope is is a series of stories that people have told you from their own real lives that you have heard, taken in, and given. It's almost you're almost invisible in in the writing in many ways. That's a very different way of writing than constructing a, a, a narrative for, for a novel. And, uh, and Miranda would like to know which style of writing you have found most rewarding, this kind of narrative non-fiction or the creation of a story based on, based on fact. Oh, look, I'll go the, the fiction, historical fiction any day of the week. Much easier for me to put words in other people's mouths than my own. <laughs> and I'm a little bit They're sort of- The writer. <laughs> Right, I don't want to reveal too much about myself. But yeah, and so what I did, I took those those storylines or those vignettes that had happened to me and then classified them into those areas related to listening. As you know, the sort of practice of listening to add to your elders, listening to children, listening to yourself. And um, I've got a few years um, under my belt. So there's a lot there for me to draw from and to then slot them in and uh, also, I cannot give enough credit, particularly for writing stories, or and actually all of them, to my amazing editors. They are the ones that know how to structure these stories into to what they then become, and um, yeah, can't do it without them. How did you choose which of the many thousands and thousands of stories people have trusted you with over the years at all your many, many worldwide events in loads of different languages. How did you find down and choose which ones should make it into Stories of Hope? That was the challenge, for sure. And it was a matter of trying to get a, a variety and to be able to not have just me talking about stories that I've, I've heard about the Holocaust. And when it came to writing the, the story that I did about my time working in a hospital, well, I had 20 years worth of storylines to choose. But I must always be respectful of the fact that when I worked there, um, that uh, the, the privilege I had of being able to try and help patients and families and friends does uh, you know, not bind me to a confidentiality, but even if it didn't, I would respect the, the confidentiality of the people who told me those stories. The ones that I have chosen to tell uh, are ones that I've either got permission from, uh, from the people, or I just wanted to mix it up in terms of where that storyline came from. And you hear about a story about my daughter and son-in-law. I, I got their permission to write that. And that was very, very personal to me to be able to tell that. And I've already heard from readers that reading that has helped them identify something they too missed. I'm talking about postnatal depression and a loved one, not in yourself. Yeah, yeah. no, and it, it does. And I, I, and I certainly, find that people need encouragement to talk about things that we all ought to be able to talk about that would be easier if we did talk mm -hmm. about and so the the power of listening is actually a superpower isn't it it's a superpower that can can heal the world yeah i guess look the trick is if somebody's talking to you and, and it's it sounds like they're starting to say something to you that is um, personal it's it's got some depth to it and if they go quiet i mean my number one trick 
for ever getting people to talk to me was to shut up. <laughs> Don't feel the need to fill the silence. Just, just let it play out for a while and see what happens. And even then, if it doesn't um, start to change and then there's still this heavy silence starting to form, then just repeat back to whoever you're talking to the last thing you heard them say. That tells them you were listening. But yeah, there's rule number one, guys, shut up. <laughs> oh dear, I can't, I can't shut up. I've only got you for a few more minutes, sorry. <laughs> Uh, Tell me, in, 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 this, in Stories of Hope, you give us, at the end, a little bit of hope about the next Heather Morris book that's going to come into our hands. Tell us a bit yeah. about that. Um, I think I've been told the 17th of October next year, so we have a publication date. Um, oh, all it's I have soon. To Christmas. So there you go. But um, it's just all these weird circumstances. And I think I've indicated to you that thousands of people have written to me uh, over the last couple of years. And I respond to so many of them, particularly the ones that tell me something that need a response other than just thank you for writing to me. But in June last year, I was in South Africa. So here's this Kiwi girl who currently lives in Australia, in South Africa. And I was there at a wire book festival in a wine region, a beautiful Franschhoek. And I got back to my hotel room and it was one or two in the morning and I decided to read an email. Uh, clearly, I hadn't had enough wine to drink if I was not wanting to go to bed. Anyway, um, alcohol comes into my soul and my stories, doesn't it? But I read this email and it was from a man who lives in Toronto in Canada. He had picked up my book and now the Canada has the same cover as we have in Australia. You can see it behind me, it's black and it's just got two arms coming down and it's got Lully and Gita's numbers on them. But he picked it up at Toronto airport and flew to Tel Aviv to visit his mum. Two days later, he accidentally left it on her coffee table because he was still trying to finish reading it. His 93 year old mother walked past, looked down at the cover and she said, oh, that must be about Lully and Gita. She knew exactly who that story was about by just looking at the cover. She saw the numbers on Gita's arm and she then looked at the number on her arm, which is only three apart. And her sister Sibby, her older sister Sibby, is two apart. To cut a long story short, I emailed immediately back. A couple of days later, I was in Cape Town and I have had a message saying that this lady wanted to talk to me. So I phoned her and I sent all those emails and, and, and fed back to London. I published this, this story that was coming out and how she told me things that I had not heard from Lully and, and that I could not find reference anywhere else to. It's simply, it's a story of three sisters and their survival, three sisters, incredible. Now Lottie, who I just mentioned to you, who, the Dana in the book, now Lottie also went into Auschwitz with two sisters and she held each one as they died. So here was a 93 year old lady in Tel Aviv telling me that her, the three sisters had survived. So I said to um, my publisher in London, look, I think I need to go to Israel. And by now I think I've managed to get to Johannesburg. And I said, I'll go back to Melbourne tomorrow and then I'll fly there. And she Kate said, no, you won't. She said, you'll just go there now. Just we'll, we'll reroute you from Johannesburg to Tel Aviv. I said, but Kate, I've run out of clean knickers. She said, well, you know, learn to wash or shop. <laughs> And so, yes, 24 hours later, um, I arrived in Tel Aviv and this amazing family, and I have to say family, of these three sisters, two of whom are still alive. They're 94 and 96 years of age. And I spent another week with them in January. I should have been back there in June, but of course I can't fly. And um, this story, look, and for you people out there, it's not just another Holocaust story, okay? It's not. Yes, there is elements, of course, in, in, in Auschwitz-Birkenau, because they were there. They went in the same train as Gita from April 42 to January 45. You know, the longest period that you could have been there, because the girls in Slovakia were the first Jewish people, boys or girls, taken in. The very first were girls from Slovakia. Their escape from the death march, of which you read a little snippet, um, that's just part of a four week escape by these girls trudging in the middle of winter through Poland and Germany to be able to get to the allies. But that doesn't, it doesn't end there. 
when they get back to Slovakia and they're still not wanted there, they're still outcasts. Well, what do these young girls do? Well, they're probably young women by now. I think they're probably about what well, Nubia would have been. So she was 15, 17 and 19 when they went in. So they're now like 17, 18, 20, 22, excuse me. <coughs> Well, they joined together with several other young survivors, Jewish survivors, and went into the forest in Czechoslovakia. And they trained to become freedom fighters to go and help fight for the creation of the state of Israel. I'm just going to have a sip of water, excuse me. Yeah, of course. That, and, and the fact that that arose so organically in that way, that that story fell, in, fell towards you because of the, the gravity that your listening skills have created is, is wonderful. Absolutely and wonderful. I, I talked to this 94 year old on WhatsApp video on my phone with her on the other end and it's just wonderful. <laughs> and so that's October the 17th yes. next year. Now these three sisters then, as I say, were helped create uh, the state of Israel. The two of them worked in the home of the first president of Israel. President Wiseman, his wife came to, to Libya's wedding and that's how ingrained they are in the creation of this, this state. Goodness me. Well, that's a, yet a, another reason. This will keep us going till October 17 next year. And, you know, it's, uh, and then, we'll, then we'll get that one. Um, we, I've just noticed the time, I'm so sorry. Um, we just got one more question um, from, from readers that we'd like to ask, and actually I wanted to talk about it anyway, so it's really exciting. Um, the people who made The Cry, the absolutely fabulous drama series, um, um, fairly recently, I think it might even still be on BBC iPlayer here in, here in the UK, um, are currently working on a series of The Tattooist of Auschwitz. Tell yes. us about that. And Kim, that answers your question. Yes, there are plans for a TV drama and it's happening. Yes, it is. So um, Claire and Adrian and Ruth from Synchronicity, just we could, I, well, I could not sign that contract quick enough when they made an offer for a six part mini series as opposed to just a two hour feature film. Yeah. Um, and there has been some developments in it and it's you know, developed. Uh, very, very recently in the last couple of weeks, because everything got screwed up, didn't it? But of course, good old COVID. But um, yeah, it's, it's going to be made, folks, and it'll be coming to a screen near you. Well, a little screen, a television screen. But with the, the way that television drama has developed in the, in the last decade, it's the right medium for this story, isn't it? It's not a, a big screen blockbuster. It's a, it's a story from, from the heart. It needs that time to unfold, I, I think. I think it's a perfect match. I'm very excited. You and me, absolutely. And um, the way it's going to be told is uh, just not straight from the book, shall we say. It's not going to just start at page one and end at page whatever the last page is. Uh, the, the weaving of it is uh, going to be uh, quite beautiful. And I'm uh, very, very proud to have a little role as the script consultant uh, in terms of bringing this to, to the screen. I'm so glad that you're involved in it, though. You're not handing it completely over. We, we, we've got Heather Morris's hands are still there holding, holding this very precious story that you were trusted with. Well, it's not that I don't trust in, anybody in the making of it, but it was just paramount to me that the depiction of Lolly's character in particular, I wanted it to be protected to the man that I knew. And while I've been able to provide them with videotapes, because I've got lots of videotape of them, um, I did stick them in front of uh, a camera several times, but um, still I need to know that, that that man that I knew that trusted me to tell his story, uh, he, that continues through to the screen. That's so exciting. And, uh, and of course, we, we have to end on Larry, don't we? Because he was the beginning as well. Um, mm -hmm. Stories of Hope is, is out now and is um, yes, a collection of vignettes that, in which you are showing us, Heather, how valuable listening is and giving us some very wise and real advice about how to do that, how to be that listening person that you were and that you continue to be as your wonderful books. 
keep coming to us. Thank you so very, very much for joining us, Heather. It's been an absolute honour to talk to you. Thank you. Oh, next time in person, please. I'm, I'm told that I can be vaccinated in March against COVID and oh, uh, it might be one advantage of being an old shop. The government's going to roll it out to the over 65s and uh, guess what, I'm over 65. Uh, so, yes, once I'm vaccinated, I've made it clear that I'm very happy to travel again and uh, and I want to do that because I'd much rather be sitting in a room with you, trust me, with all of you. It would be it would be a very, very profound honour to meet you in person. I will keep my fingers crossed for that. Ben, listen, I'm here. When Heather comes over, that's me doing that one, all right? You Thank you very, very much, Heather. And uh, we'll go back to Ben. Thank you. Massive thanks to Heather and to Antonia for that wonderful interview. Stories of Hope is available in our bookshop. We have a, a stash of signed copies um, as it stands. So do uh, give us a call 01442 827 653 and, uh, and book your copy. Um, all other purchase blurb is available in, uh, in the text below this video. Um, do subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, we'll see you next time.